Praise God. May the Lord provide more liberals in his vineyard. In Jesus' name. It is well. All right. Um, this morning we'll be talking on the topic called the blessed man. The blessed man. The blessed woman. The blessed Christian. Hallelujah. And our text is taken from the book of Psalms, chapter 1. Psalms, chapter 1. Please, can we all open our Bibles? Psalms, chapter 1. I will be reading from verse 1 through 3. It says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor seated in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. About two Friday Bible studies or three Friday Bible studies ago, we were talking of uh, principles. I think it was two, two Bible studies ago. We were talking of principles. And coincidentally, Bishop mentioned one of these as a principle. I mean, I don't know if you can recall it that day. Psalms chapter 1. Now, this is a verse or set of verses that, or a chapter rather, that uh, some of us know how to quote. You can quote it from beginning to the end. Just the way many people know how to quote uh, Psalms 23 from beginning to the end. Which one again? John 3, 16. <laughs> Those are verses we all grew up with, learning, you know, uh, and uh, it has been wonderful how far they've taken us. But today, by the Spirit of God, uh, God is going to break this bread for us and we we'll begin to see ourselves in the light of his word this morning. Hallelujah. It is a known fact that every blessing of God comes with its own demand that you have to meet. Every blessing of God comes with its demand that you have to meet. As generous as God is, when it comes to things of value, when it comes to things that are irrevocable, he wants to make sure that he is giving it to the right person. Have you heard that place where he said the gifts of God are without repentance? So when God wants to give you a blessing, when he wants to place you out there to be an example or to be a, a representative of him, he makes sure that he screens you and that you meet the minimum requirements for that glory. He makes sure you meet the minimum requirements for that, um, that level, that blessing. God doesn't just give gifts anyhow, even though he's very generous. He makes sure that you are going to represent well. There are standards everywhere in the Bible. Everywhere there are standards that if you know you really want to get the blessing, you must meet up those standards. Even in daily physical life, the, 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 the one we stay and the one we deal with, before you, you don't just go for a job and they tell you, what do you want? Oh, this, uh, this is an advice for a plumber. They, oh, yeah, I want to become a plumber. Oh, yeah, please. Oh, yeah, come and take the wrenches, take the wrench spanners and just start working. No, 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 no. They ask you, do you have the required qualifications? The same way it is, sir, ma, in scriptures, that before any glory, there are prerequisites you must meet. Hallelujah. Amen. There are some cases where God looks at you, even if you don't have them, he gives you to them. He gives them to you, sorry, before you qualify. You must have these prerequisites. They must be met. They are a standard. They can't be broken. An example is 2 Chronicles 7.14, which is another popular verse. 
if my people that are called by name, are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. He said, I will hear. Then will I hear from heaven. So it is not just automatically you pray and the answer. Say, there are requisites you need to meet to be able to get that attention you desire. Isaiah 119. If ye be willing and obedient, then you will eat the good of the land. It's a requisite. You must be willing and obedient to get that good of the land. You must be willing and obedient to get that good of the land. Everything comes with its own requirements. Proverbs 18 verse 10. He said, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. Beautiful. But who gets the salvation? The righteous runs into it. Not everybody runs into it. So when we read Bible, it is good that we read these fine lines. So that we don't just go and then, you know, begin to pray and then we begin to complain. No, God is not good. God is not faithful. God is not this. Those Christians, they are lying. No, 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 sir. They are requirements. There are something that is for everybody. An example, oxygen, all the air we breathe, you don't need to be born again to have access to it. God made that free. The sun, you don't need to be born again to enjoy the sun. Just step out of your house and you get it. The moon, you don't need to be born again to enjoy the moon. Go out at night, you see it there. That is the general benefit. But when it comes to specific things, where God's name is at stake, sir, you need to meet the requirement. I'm speaking generally now. You need to meet the requirements. Before the apostles handed the accounts of the church to other people, they told them, he said, look, we will not choose, but you go and choose. Requirements are straightforward. Number one, make sure that they have the Holy Ghost. Number two, make sure that they are men of good reports. So it is not about what you say. What do people say about you? And number three, that they have the wisdom. So you see, you need... So know these things before you launch. God will help us in Jesus' name. For the blessed man that we are talking about today, for my research and by the help of the Holy Ghost, I see that to become this man that the Bible was saying in verse 3, there are three don'ts and one do to get to this level. Three things you must not do. And just one thing that you need to do to get to this level. Let's break it down. Once again, Psalms chapter 1. That's our text scripture. So if we, if we live there, we'll come back to that place. Hallelujah. Number one, the first requirement for this wonderful level, this very enticing level, is that you must not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. If you want to be this blessed man that was described in verse 3, you must not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Now, you need to ask, what does it mean to walk in the counsel of the ungodly? It simply means you don't follow. You don't take advice. You don't listen to instructions or advice from people who don't believe in the God you serve. I repeat, you don't take counsel, you don't take advice, you don't take instructions, you don't take, what's the word, suggestions from people who don't have the spirit of God, who are not godly. You have a challenge in your marriage and the first thing you feel you need to do is to discuss with that lady who is a divorcee in the office. Are you sure you are talking to the right person? I don't know if you get what I'm trying to say today. You know, some of us take, we take suggestions from people who, and it looks, it sounds very funny. You are single, you are not married. And you want to know how marriage is. You're asking a brother who is having three, four girlfriends. How can somebody having three, four girlfriends eh, <laughs> advise you on how to keep one woman? Walk not in the counsel of the ungodly. Walk not in the counsel of the ungodly. You want to keep a home. You want to know how it is. How, how can you keep a home for 
20, 30, 40 years. The best person to ask is somebody who has been able to achieve that same feat. And he's still doing well. Do not ask. Do not seek for the counsel of the ungodly. Anybody that tells you to do what is not scriptural, anybody that gives you a foundation that negates the word of God that you have come to know, please, is not somebody you should be found with. Is not someone you should be found with. A colleague was telling me in the office, he said, ah, somebody was talking. I said, what? He said, somebody was talking to him. That's way back, way back, way back, uh, many years back. He said, no, that um, the mother-in-law was very, you know, like, um, and, like before, before he married the wife, the mother-in-law, the wife was the mother-in-law's, like, right-hand person. She knows everything about the business. She's like, she, she makes things happen, you know. So when she got married, you know, these things takes time to break. <laughs> you know, some, some relationship takes time to, you know, uh, pull apart. So the mother will call her. Where are you? Oh, yeah. She says, so-so-so person needs to supply market. Oh, yeah, handle it. This, ah, ah. And just like, hey, she's not married. <laughs> you don't give her such orders. She's a white woman. And when the husband comes from work, the wife has left work, went straight to the mother's shop. And they are doing business. The husband is at home cooking. The husband is at home. And after a while, the man was complaining. No, 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 no. No, I need, to, I, need to, I need to do something about it. I said, okay. I said, so what do you plan to do? He said, no, he, a friend has told him that when the wife comes, he should lock her in the house. She must not go anywhere. He must lock her and take action and go and meet the mother-in-law and insult the mother-in-law. Don't ever touch my wife. And I said, bros, <laughs> it's like you want to collect your dowry back. <laughs> Hallelujah. Never seek solace in the counsel of the ungodly. Mark chapter 4. Mark 4. I love the first line there. I love the first line. Mark chapter 4, verse 24. I love the first line there. He says, And he said unto them, Take heed what ye hear. That's what I did from there. What did Jesus tell them? Be careful what you hear. Be careful the things you hear. What you hear has a very strong and potent force. In affecting what you do. It has a strong and potent force in giving you direction. Take heed what you hear. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 5. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 5. He said it is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. Take heed what you hear. What you hear has a strong, has a way of influencing what you do. God help us in Jesus' name. So the first don't is don't is do what? Do not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. The second don't, he says, do not stand in the way of sinners. Do not stand in the way of sinners. Now you begin to wonder what is this saying? In life, we live Life as someone who is on a journey. Hallelujah. I'm sure we know that, right? We live life as someone who is on a journey. As a Christian, we have the way we do our things. Christianity is not a religion, as we all know. It is way, way deeper than that. Christianity is actually a way of life. It is a way of living. It is a way we have our culture. We have our constitution. Just the same way a Canadian and a Nigerian or a Canadian and a Ghanaian or a Canadian and even an American don't share the same constitution. We don't share the same constitution. There might be similarities, but it is not the same constitution. I repeat, there might be similarities. I'm sure in the US, if you kill someone, you go to jail. And the same thing here in Canada, and the same thing, I think, in so many other countries. There are some countries that even take it to the extreme. In some countries, if you kill somebody, you'll be killed. You won't go to jail. There is nothing, no jail. Straight outrightly, you get killed. That is their constitution. And when you enter there, you must respect it, irregardless of whom you are. Irregardless of whom you are. The same way, as a Christian, we have our constitution. We have our way of life. We have the way we do our things that makes us unique even in the midst of the crowd. 
Second requirement, do not walk. Don't stand in the way of sinners. But take note, it didn't say do not be a sinner. He said, but you should not be found in the path where sinners tread. Even though you are not a sinner, do not be found in the path where sinners tread. Now, let me give you an example. Someone came to report a pastor to me, a fellow pastor. And he said, sir, I don't like where I used to see this pastor. I said, okay, what, what, where is, what is that? He said, this pastor always goes to watch, there's this full, uh, soccer game we call Champions League. It's popular all over the world, you know. So back home in Nigeria, people usually watch these things. And some don't watch it in their homes. Some, they have TVs, but they prefer to watch it, like, you know, in the midst of people because of the noise. I, would, I never took tomorrow. I don't understand why they do that anyway. But they enjoy the noise and the discussion. So this pastor will go to what we call beer parlor. Uh, over here, we call it a pub. I think we call it a pub or something. And you will go there and sit down and watch the football match. He doesn't drink beer. He doesn't do anything wrong. The only thing is that he goes there to watch football or soccer. Now, this person said, how, do, how does it look like? Is he committing sin? He's not drinking beer. He's not humanizing. He's not doing anything. But the environment which he is, People are smoking, people are drinking, people are doing all sorts of things, and you are there in their midst. It's not as if you are preaching the gospel, or God led you to go there and preach to somebody, and then you begin to wonder, should you be found in that place? If somebody who is still growing, you know, like a baby Christian, sees you there, what message do you pass across? There are some things we do. We need to weigh we need to weigh the repercussions before we go into them. There are some places as a Christian you should not be found. Because the question you should ask yourself is, is there no other place you can watch this same football, this soccer match? Is there no other place you can watch it? Oh, I'm bored at home. Okay, I feel like going to a social gathering. And the next thing we see, we see you in the club as a Christian. You begin to ask, is there no other place you feel you can see and you know, like catch some excitement? Must it be in the club? If people see you there, how do you think? Are you representing God well there? Because as a Christian, you are a representative of God. You know that? You carry God in you, you carry the Holy Ghost. And now you carry the Holy Ghost into a clubhouse. You begin to ask, do you think that place is convenient? Is that a place you think God will be convenient to relate with? We, we know we should ask. I will ask some certain questions and see to know if we are doing it right. Remember, this Christianity you have chosen to accept is a way of life. And whatever is worth doing at all, as we say, is worth doing well. The question we ask ourselves this morning is this, are we doing it well? Are we doing it well? God help us in Jesus' name. Amen. I was talking to a man, a, a, a brother, and we were talking, and he said, "Oh, there is this. Um, no, there is this. We call a, um, they call it locally. In Nigeria, they call it agbo. So start here. I don't know how to explain agbo to you, but it's a it's a traditional herb, um, like a, an herb. You know that a sort of herb where you put um, any um, fluid to make it to extract the juice from it, and then you can take it. It's medicinal anyway." Very medicinal, very good, nothing wrong with it. So we're talking about, I said, oh, the best thing that can extract this thing, which is true, is if you get anything that has like an alcoholic content, it will be very fast to extract. Now you get what I'm saying, right? It's very good to extract that juice from it. And I said, oh, I said, I said that's true. But the challenge is this. Where do they sell the alcohol? I need to go to my Toba liquor shops to get it. Now, if Sister Vera sees Pastor B, Bringing two, ba uh, two bags of uh, whiskey out of uh, my Toba liquor. <laughs> Pastor B, ah, I said it that this man's belly, this man's stomach is not rice and beans. There is more to it. But in sincerity, why did I go there? I went there for medicinal purpose. <laughs> you, are giving, you are giving me a way to escape it, right? <laughs> Praise God. No, that, no, that's a good option. You know what I'm trying to say? I'm that there are some things you do, you weigh the repercussions and the effects they will cause, the signals they will send. Bishop was telling me something the other day and I looked at him and I said, this is, this is very true. 
He said there's a difference between misappropriation and embezzlement. And I said, this is very true. Yeah, it's two different things. But do you get punished for the two? Yes. I know somebody who was, who was sacked from work for misappropriation. It did not, you know, the difference is this. When you embezzle, embezzle money, means you stole the money. You actually stole it. Misappropriation means you don't know how the money went. You didn't steal it, but you just can't account for what happened. All you know is that $1 million got missing from the account. How did it get missing? I, I don't understand. I, I, I kept the file. It's not in the file. I don't know. You can't defend that money, but you didn't steal it. Will you not be punished? You will still be punished. So there are some things in life that we count under that umbrella of misappropriation. You didn't do it. I didn't go there to buy whiskey for grooving or for enjoyment. I went there for a medicinal purpose. But somebody outside sees you. We not know that is why you went there. Will you put a tag on your body and say, please, I, I help. Praise God, I only came here to, for health reasons, so I didn't come here to do another thing. Is that possible? But you've left a message for that person. That that person might not be, ever, be able to ask you, what did you go and do there? Back home, you know, so many years back in Nigeria, I we were, we were closing from church and the brothers left, you know, left a, a, a bit earlier than us. When we were going on, we saw the brother. I don't know if you remember, so that, uh, is it Blue Bird Hotel? They call it the, aha. Uh -huh. And we saw the brother come out of there with uh, <laughs> bottled water. Uh -huh. We closed us for about 40 minutes. You know, we closed the service and we were still back in the church doing some things. And we, went, and we saw him come out of a, a brothel. That's a place where prostitutes, you know, or do the operations. And we saw Christian brother after a fire prayer. With coming outside that place with uh, bottled water. You know, we, know we were confused. And, and I called him, brother. I don't want to mention his name. Brother, where don't sir? Ah, brother, brother, where don't sir? Ah, is this? Ah, well, I don't mean I, I, I can't hold this. I will ask now. I said, sir, I'm so, ah, what were you doing there? He said, I went to buy bottled water. I said, oh, why didn't you buy from the last? He said, they were closed. And truly, they were closed. Now, I understood because I asked. But what if somebody else who saw you leaving the church or somebody we've been preaching to around that area and this is our, our own brother leaving a brothel, will you not say, ah, I said it. There is no real Christian again in this world. The brother just finished prayer. He went now to receive uh, fresh breeze. Now he's coming out. Even he's taking butter to cool the tension. Let us be very careful where they find us. What God is telling us here is that where you are part time, you carry God. I don't know what to, I don't know if you understand. You are representing heaven anywhere you go. So wherever you go, people are watching to see you show that representation. May God not find us where he should not find us. In the name of Jesus. God doesn't look for people everywhere, sir. He goes to where you should be. Not where you are. It goes to where you should be. When God went to the garden, do you think he's, he's not an all-seeing God? He should have known Adam was not where he was. But where did he go? He went to where he usually meets Adam. God and you, they have a particular meeting point. If God goes there and doesn't see you, something is wrong. He didn't go. He knew where Adam was. He knew, but he knew, no, I must follow standards. This is where we always meet. And he went there, he didn't meet Adam. Adam, where are you? At every point in time, let God see you where he left you. Let God see you where he left you. The last place he left you was a place of integrity. Let him come back and meet you in that same place. The last place he left you was a place of prayer. Let him come back and meet you where he left you. Don't let God ever find you. May you not miss the way in the name of Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 14 to 17. Let's read that. And I move to the next. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Second Corinthians 6. Are we there, sir? Okay, we'll start from verse 14. Verse 14. He said, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God 
with idols. For ye are the temple of the living God. I think we'll stop there. You are what? The temple. What does the temple mean? The housing. So God lives in you. Just the way, you know, Bishop Mrs. used to, I like that term particularly, I don't know, call it baby straddle, have we? Anywhere she goes, anywhere she faces, the baby goes. The same way, wherever you go, God goes with you. Please, respect who you carry. If you don't respect yourself, but please respect who you carry. There has been so much insult that God is enduring. The command of us carry him to places he should not be. I leave you with that word. Respect what? Respect who you carry. God will help us in Jesus' name. What is the third don't? He said, he that seated in the seat of the scornful. This is all about association. You are not the scornful, but you sit where they sit. First Corinthians 15.33 He said, evil communication corrupts good manners. Association, sir. If you want to be this blessed man in verse 3, association matters a lot. Association matters a lot. Who do you relate to? Who are the people that are very close? Who are the people that influence you? Whether we like it or not, I always tell people that friends, let me use that word, friends, or they, they call it more in youth circle, we call it peer pressure, right? Is to me one of the strongest, if not the strongest influence. Do you know your husband can tell you something, your spouse generally, male or female, can tell you to do something, and your friend outside will tell you, and you obey your friend and leave your, leave your, leave your spouse. Those of us who are married will understand what I'm trying to say. That is how powerful, how powerful peers, people you move with, matters. Do I have witnesses in the house? Where your wife will tell you to do something, ah, I'm not doing it. And a friend will come and say, ah, What's going to say? My wife told me to buy this car. And I said, No, buy the car now. The car is not bad. The car is okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. And you buy. But their wife has been on that same issue <laughs> for months. And he said, No, we don't need it. That's a waste of money. Suddenly a friend comes and he said, Oh, uh, that car you said, I think we should buy it. I'm going to wonder, Oh, why? Oh, what's going on? That is how powerful association is. The Bible does not deny the fact that association is powerful. That's why I said it. He said, be not deceived. Don't deceive yourself. Evil communication corrupts good manners. There is always that influence. Iron, sharpened iron. You can't run from it. It is powerful. So, having that agreed is powerful, what should we do? They make sure that good influence are the ones around you. I repeat, having that agreed that influence is powerful, then what do we do? Make sure that there are good ones around you because subconsciously or unconsciously, you will always be influenced. But the issue now is make sure we are influenced for good. So the people you surround yourselves with matters a lot. In fact, they determine to a very large extent your speed in life. They determine to a large extent the peace you have in life. They determine to a large extent how high you fly. The influence around you. Apostle was saying something a couple of days back. He said at a point now, he has to change the friends he keeps. Why? Because where he wants to get to, he needs people of that circle around him. Once again, you like it, you don't like it, there is an influence that subconsciously, means that you might not even know it, influences you. Based on people around you. God will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Proverbs 19, 29. Proverbs 19, 29. I read, it says, Judgments are prepared for scorners and stripes for the back of fools. The Bible recognizes those who do all these things, who sit with scorners, it calls them fools because you should know better. The Bible says you should know better. Romans chapter 1, verse 32. Romans 1, 32. It says, Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, 
Not only those who do the same, but those who have pleasure in them that do them. A, a pastor was quoting this scripture to me during the week. Not only those who do it, but those that have pleasure in them that do such. God will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. I am not doing it, but I see those doing it and support them. According to biblical standard, you are also the same thing in the eyes of God. I am not doing it, and they are doing it in your sight, and you are comfortable with it. In the sight of God, you are the same thing. They are smoking, whatever they are smoking, and you are there in their midst. I'm not smoking. I'm only there. You know, um, we, are talking food, we are talking sports. We are talking politics, but I'm not smoking. As long as the Bible is from biblical standard, as far as God is concerned, all of you there are smoking. Science even proves it that you're also smoking because you're inhaling what they're doing. So, <laughs> even though you're not taking it from the mouth, you are taking it just from the nose. Everything goes to the lungs. It is all about association. James chapter 4, verse 4. He said, ye adulterers and adulteresses. Now, James was not writing that letter. That's what struck me. James is not writing a letter to the world, though. That letter was written to Christian. <laughs> that letter was written to the church. And he was saying, he said, ye are daughters. So even in the church, there could be, or there are, adulterers and adulteresses. What were they? He said, ye are daughters and adulteresses. He said, know ye not that the friendship with the world is enmity with God? You cannot serve God and mammon, sir. Don't mix it. If you want to drink cold water, drink cold water. If you want it hot, drink it hot. Don't be in the middle. God hates lukewarmness. See that in Revelations. He said, you are neither hot nor cold. Don't, if you want to drink hot water, if you want to be a Christian, please, let us do this Christianity and do it well. This is my standard. Anything I do, if I want to do something, if I chose that, okay, this thing, I want to do it. I put in everything in me. Everything in me to do it. Sleepless nights, I will make sure I do it. And I do it well. I do it well. I remember back in the days then, somebody was, I was walking one day and one of my colleagues came, so, Ah, no, this security is your destiny. I said, security will be your destiny. <laughs> security will be your destiny. <laughs> Why did he say that? Because he saw me putting every effort to make sure I put my best there. He said, <laughs> he said well, I got a reference letter from one of my instructors, and he was like, oh, this guy is this, he's that. I, am, I can defend him anywhere. I can recommend him. He's a good power engineer. I said, this one is better. Now I said, this one is your destiny. <laughs> Hallelujah. Anything you find, your, your hand finds to do, do it well. That is my logo, and I make sure I do it as, as God helped me. So we'll be able to discuss the three do nots. And I thought there's only one thing God wants you to do in verse 2. Psalms 1, verse 2. He said, but who? These delights. His delight is what? It's in the law of the Lord. And in this law doth he meditate day and night. Psalm chapter 1 verse 2. So that is the only do besides the three don'ts that God expects. Your delight should be in the law of the Lord. And in this book, this Bible, should you meditate day and night. And I remember first uh, Timothy 4, I think verse 12 or 13. He said, he said give yourselves wholly to these things. Holy, so that your prophet will appear to all. People of God, I think, let's check that first Timothy, so I don't quote it. I think first Timothy 4, is it 12 or 13? First Timothy 4, oh, verse 15. First Timothy 4, 15. He said, meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Verse 12 is another popular one. That's why I said, let no man despise thy youth. So that one to stuck to me. Hallelujah. Please, I'm tying it all up now. To be the blessed man. I don't know if you are like me. Who envies what this blessed man is enjoying? My God. In verse 3, he says, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither. Whether winter, whether summer, leaf is always green. And whatsoever, that is the one I like inside. Whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. I like this. I like this. In fact, if not for any reason, 
This alone is enough for me to observe what is in verse 1 and verse 2. That whatsoever he do it, meaning he goes to school excellently well. Where he's working, excellently well. He's doing this one, excellence. He's doing that, excellence. In the church, excellence. At work, excellence. Anywhere you go, excellence. Whatsoever he does, he prospers. Who wants to be this blessed man? Hallelujah. The question now is this. Are we ready to observe the prerequisites? God help us in Jesus' name.